All right, so I've got 305, so we'll go ahead and, and get the session started. Um, so hello and welcome everyone to the Power of Partnership, a graduate college and university library connection. Um, sharing this information with you is uh, Natalia Bauer, Wendy Cartier, um, Corinne Bishop, Lee Dotson, Sarah Norris, and Carrie Botroff. I'm so sorry if I mispronounced <laughs> any last names. As someone whose last name is Wookner, I do know. <laughs> I do know how that is, so I apologize. Um, so I, my name is Emily, and I will be your moderator for the um, time of this presentation. And so just a quick reminder before we get, begin, um, during the presentation, please keep your audio and video muted. Um, and please feel free to use the Q&A tab to post questions which will be addressed during the Q&A portion. Um, and so I will go ahead and turn it over to our presenters. Well, thank you, Emily. I'll, I'll go ahead and get us started again. My name is Natalia Bauer. I'm an assistant director with the College of Graduate Studies at UCF. And i um, just going to tell you a little bit about UCF first and then uh, ask the rest of our panelists to introduce themselves and what they do. Um, but UCF stands for University of Central Florida. If you're not familiar with us, we're located in Orlando, Florida. Uh, we first graduated students in 1968, so we are a relatively young university, um, but we are very large. <laughs> we have currently, I just looked this up, uh, 70,730 students. Um, uh, currently, we have 10,362 graduate students and medical school students. So um, relatively large, large university, but we want to show to you that you don't necessarily have to be a large university with a lot of resources to have great partnerships. Um, the way our partnership works is that we are a centralized college of graduate studies. Uh, we've had a college of graduate studies a little over 10 years now. Um, prior to that, it was a division of graduate studies. But we, uh, just to let us know what we do, we do centralized admissions. Um, we do centralized policies um, and things like that on behalf of the university. We do a lot of uh, centralized processing for all of the other colleges on our campus including in that is uh, ETD processing. So we work with our partners at the UCF libraries to do the ETD, um, the ETD um, submission process, or in part, that's what we work with our uh, partners at the library on. Uh, we also have other services that we offer uh, or that they offer through uh, the libraries. So we um, began our ETD program in 2004. Uh, it started with a... Um, with a working group. Uh, Lee is one of the original members of that, so <laughs> she's she's still here from that. I was not here, but I came in a few years later. Um, but we've had ETDs at UCF since 2004, so our programs, it's, it's getting up there in age, actually. <laughs> um, but uh, basically, that kind of is what I think I would say probably set the tone for some of the partnerships that we have, or the strong partnership, I'd say, we have um, between the grad college and the libraries. Um, but uh, yeah, that's basically kind of a little overview about UCF um, and just kind of invite each of our uh, panelists to just say uh, what their role is uh, a in their unit and basically what we do to support uh, students, graduate students here at UCF through the ETD process. So um, let's start with um, Corrine, uh, if you'd like to start us off. Sure, uh, Corrine Bishop. Um I serve as the UCF engagement librarian for graduate students and postdoctoral researchers. I'm also a social sciences liaison. Um, are we just going around and introducing ourselves now or are we? You can go, go ahead and, and okay. yeah, you can go ahead and go into, I figure that's probably just easier at this point, sure. just to make sure we have enough time at the end for Q and A. So go ahead sure. and yeah, let them know what you do. <laughs> All right. So um, I've been, uh, I've served as a graduate engagement librarian at UCF for about six years. And during that time, I've collaborated with Natalia and, Natalia, excuse me, and others um, a lot at Graduate Studies to provide several events to support grad students and postdoctoral researchers. Um, as part of our collaborations, we've offered thesis and dissertation forums that have included full and half day sessions uh, for masters and doctoral students. The programs also included um, invited speakers from the UCF faculty, the University Writing Center, Sage Publishing, and sessions that covered um, topics about 
thesis and dissertation formatting, strategies for conducting lit reviews, scholarly communication and publishing topics, and citation management. Um, additionally, we've also collaborated on a lot of, a lot of other projects, uh, some of which uh, were programs for the university's research week events, uh, where the library um, had sessions. We've also uh, collaborated on providing information about library services in the Graduate Students Guide to Success, Success which is a Canvas course um, provided by Grad Studies and partnered um, each year in the fall for library orientations where Grad Studies helps us promote the sessions um, by contacting students and sending out announcements and also um, announcing the orientations in their Canvas course for graduate students. So as part of uh, my graduate assignment, graduate engagement assignment, I also collaborate or excuse me, coordinate the library's graduate and postdoc uh, workshops each semester. Uh, we collaborate to schedule and promote the sessions and then they're presented in graduate studies pathways to success programming. Our workshops are presented by UCF librarians and um, they are presented either in the graduate studies presentation room or online via Zoom. And the topics cover um, a range of interest or topics of interest to graduate students who are planning research projects or working on course assignments. Currently, we offer about 10 sessions, actually not about, we offer 10 sessions, <laughs> including a three-part getting started series that covers some foundational topics that aren't typically taught in uh, the program curriculum. And they include lit review and library research, EndNote or Zotero citation management, and selecting journals to publish your research. It's often assumed that graduate students um, already know how to use academic resources, but most graduate students do benefit from learning strategies about locating and using those academic resources and especially resources uh, that are related to their discipline or their research um, areas. So as many of you likely know, academic libraries offer a wide range of services for graduate students, such as providing support through subject liaisons um, and research consultations, their research guides, course instruction, and many libraries also um, partner with other campus units like graduate colleges and writing centers. And these are real um, helpful, useful, valuable um, partnerships because they definitely promote student connections with library services. And um, due to our strong partnership with Natalia and others like Wendy and others at Graduate Studies, we have reached um, many students who would probably go through programs and not be totally aware of the services that are available to them and how librarians can support them in their academic goals. So in closing, I'll just um, share that, proudly share that through our workshops alone, we've reached approximately 2,000 students to date um, who are enrolled in programs across the university. And our overall feedback from students is that these programs are helping them um, and supporting them in their academic goals. And our success um, in outreach is due in large part to our partnerships, our great partnership with College of Graduate Study, Studies, which has significantly helped connect students and researchers with library services and just promote overall the visibility of the library on campus. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Corrine. Mm -hmm. um, let's have um, Carrie. Let's have Carrie go next. <laughs> Uh, she, there okay, was there the, you go. Carrie needs to unmute. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. So I'm Carrie Bottorf, and I am an adjunct librarian here at UCF. I do a wide variety of projects. Um, you name it, I've probably touched it. Um, primarily working in 
STARS, which is UCF's institutional repository, which Lee is going to talk about more later. Um, briefly, we STARS is part of BPRESS. It's um, one of the digital commons um, instances. We went live in mid-2015. And up until that point, we had we were using Content DM for our digital collections, and we kind of cobbled together some collections of ETDs and RTDs just here and there the best we could to make things work. Well, once STARS went live and we had an, an excellent place to display these, we needed a way to migrate them into STARS, but we really wanted to do it the most efficient way possible and the best way possible. And that included working with Wendy and Natalia in grad studies in order to ensure that we were displaying what I felt was important information about each work to display, but also what they felt was important from their standpoint and ensuring that the accurate, the information was accurate. Um, and that came from either the original PDF record, the original print record, if we go back to previous to doing ETDs, but then comparing it with their records, which are the authoritative records for ETDs. Um, so what I did is I took the ETD collection that I had built out in Content DM and then worked, like I said, with Natalia and Wendy to compare the records, compare what they had, and display it in such a way that was good for everybody involved, good for the students, most importantly, or the alumni, most importantly, but also to ensure that it worked for what grad studies needed for their items. Um, one of the challenges that we faced over the years that seems to be an ongoing issue is really how students don't natively deposit into STARS because grad studies has built a very robust and very good system for maintaining student information, maintaining format review, communication with students, things like this. And we didn't want to, we didn't want to interfere with that because it works very well for them. And while STARS does have a lot of, or Digital Commons specifically has a lot of things that it can do, it wasn't everything that they needed and we needed to maintain what they had. So one of the face challenges that we have faced through the years is how to get the PDFs from grad studies to the library. And we've gone through a variety of different ways to do it. The way we do now really works well. So until that doesn't work, we won't mess with it. So it took some time. Um, we've definitely changed things, changed what types of reports their system generates, um, the fields that it generates, what it sends to me, what their reports can show, what I pull from PDFs, various things like that. But with definitely with trial and error, we have a very good system now. And it's been developed you know, like I said, really over a lot of years, and it works. And they send a report to me every semester, and it has very good, very basic information on it that they have compiled through their system, but that I'm able to then plug into the batch upload process in STARS. And it's almost seamless. It's a lot of copying and pasting from spreadsheets, and it it really works. Um, I do clean it up some, you know, simple things. Um, this kind of goes into one thing that another partnership is they wanted a way to get a lot more statistics because anybody who uses Digital Commons knows that the statistics you can get from it are just fantastic. Um, so we worked with ways to create that, one of which was using the auto collect features that are in Digital Commons to create a variety of other collections. So obviously things live in one place in our ETD collection, but we pull them into various other collections. We have a graduate thesis and dissertations only, so it excludes statistics for the honors undergraduate thesis program. They like to show um, the doctoral dissertation statistics and master thesis statistics. So we created a couple different collections for there. But then I started getting requests for specific college or departmental level collections. So we created those too. And it's really nice when somebody reaches out 
say from engineering and wants to see what their statistics look like, I can point them right to that collection. And all of that comes directly out of the partnerships that we've built and meeting each other's needs. Another, um, not collection, but a custom search that came about was they, grad studies was being contacted by advisors and dissertation chairs. I was being contacted by people. What have I chaired? What have I served as a thesis advisor on? Things like this. So I was able to create custom searches and I have a dynamic list that I update about once a year because it's a lot um, of pre-populated searches and the advisors can just go to the page, click on their name, and it shows every thesis that they have either served as a thesis advisor, dissertation, a committee chair, I guess, for, and it goes back, I think anybody who has served since about 2015 forward but it does show everything they've done. So some of our faculty who have been here for many, many years, it does show all of their work. So the other, briefly, I'm gonna to touch on our RTD collection um, that we have been working on for a lot of years, but this collection has also evolved and we have also worked together to pull in, um, you know, existing lists, catalog searches, records that they have had, print copies versus, you know, what's in their systems that only go back so far, obviously, because, you know, we weren't collecting a lot of that data. Um, and so we have built digital collection now in STARS for our, our RTDs. And those were also added into STARS, which has also generated exposure for those legacy works and it's it, it's very exciting it's really exciting to see what just a simple email to somebody can create and just build over the years so that's about it for me thank you and i realize i'm sorry i went out of order a little bit i i know you guys are laughing at me <laughs> Um, I know I meant to, to call on Lee first. My apologies. So I think we can we can rectify that now and uh, have Lee go next. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> so, but Lee can tell you a little bit more about stars, which we've inadvertently <laughs> introduced in advance. So <laughs> that's okay. We'll we'll get there. Um, so I did want to say, you know, Natalia, you mentioned that we started in 2004 with that group and the group has changed over the years based on changes in resources and staffing and technology and what the students need and you know what the needs of each unit is. So um, in the beginning, it was graduate studies, the library, the writing center and our faculty multimedia center. So um, you can see on the panel today that, you know, that has changed a little bit, but it's always, the heart of it is always, what can we do to support graduate studies and the students working on their theses and dissertations. Um, from the library, my goal in the beginning was focused on sustainable long-term access. So no matter how we have done that, that is really the goal that we're going for there. Um, when we began hosting in 2004, we had no institutional repository. So my part of this discussion is the benefits of an institutional repository. So from 2004 to 2015, we did not have one. So I did want to acknowledge that a little bit here. Um, so we did host the ETDs on a server and we had manual embargoes. Some of those we are continuing to try to get <laughs> migrated over um, off of those manual embargoes. They were accessed through a link in our catalog record. So our catalogers are still very involved in this process even now, um, but of course, what they do has morphed over the years as well. Um, and then as Carrie stated, we had the metadata and a content DM collection to expose it so that people could hopefully find it outside of just the catalog. Um, so then when STARS came online, we had all these new opportunities. So I thought I would just share five um, ways that the IR supports our ETD services at UCF. So the first one is we make the ETDs findable and discoverable. So it's very search engine friendly. This is what we always tell people about digital commons. If you want it to be found, Google will find it. A majority of the downloads are a direct result of a Google search. So it makes them very findable and discoverable, wonderful. However, not everybody likes that. So number two is we can restrict access to ETDs and we do. So we have um, IP restrictions. 
So they're only restricted to UCF IP addresses, as well as embargoes on top of those IP restrictions. And now that the items are in stars, they have an automated embargo release. So no more lists of, Wendy, Natalia, can you confirm that we need to lift these restrictions and going through all that? So thankfully, we can make them discoverable. We can restrict those that need to be restricted. We also, like Carrie mentioned, provide statistics. So really, that third thing for statistics, the readership information and the downloads are phenomenal, whether it's for the entire collection or a subset. And right now, fun fact, um, graduate theses and dissertations are closing in on 3 million total downloads. And that's only since they've been in there in 2015. So really exciting. The other piece of that is the author dashboard provides graduates access to their own statistics. So if we have their email, they can log in, they have their account, they can see their own downloads. If their email isn't there, they just contact Carrie and she is happy to add emails for anybody who needs it added. So we do make sure that they, they have that information. We also can allow multiple administrators and a variety of privileges on those so that um, if Carrie isn't there, I can help out or, you know, we can give Wendy and Natalia access, whatever people want to do, we want to make sure that it is a seamless process and everybody can make sure that it is working. So um, we uh, do have that and we can restrict privileges. So if people just need to go in and look at something, but not necessarily edit it, um, we do that as well because we want to maintain the, uh, the good solid record for that ETD. And then the last thing is it accommodates a variety of workflows. So Carrie touched on this earlier that that workflow has changed over the years. So it's over time, things change and the workflows change, but also depending on what we're doing in STARS, we can have multiple workflows. So she can batch upload via a spreadsheet or batch upload through XML, or we can upload them one at a time. So if there's some one-offs that just come in here and there, if one got skipped in the batch upload, we can do that. We can log in and change one field at a time, or we can do a batch edit on a spreadsheet. If there's a a whole lot of fields that need to be updated. If a college name changed in between people submitting things, so we can go in and do those things. Um, the review processes, if we wanted to do um, you know, any sort of back-end review of these and use some of those things, those workflows are built in. Um, and also, like Carrie said, create those subsets of materials for ease of navigation. And I will say that that probably from an IR perspective, aside from Google, and statistics is one of the biggest benefits we have because we have had folks contact us and say, I saw that engineering or history or somebody else has a collection. Why can't I have a collection? Oh, you can. Can I have one for a regional campus? Can I have one you know, just for these? Yes. So we definitely um, put those examples out there because we know that the more people see them and the more people can see how it will work, the more people will want them for themselves too. So that is my part. Thank you. You're before, welcome. Before I introduce our, our last speaker, just to kind of wrap up with, with STARS and working on that side of our library partnership, um, you know, it, if there's something we need, you all are always open to that and vice versa. If you need support, um, you know, why STARS is so important. You know, I remember we had our dean write a letter to support that because we were like, we're the only university that doesn't have one in our state, you know, those sorts of things. <laughs> um, but then even like helping get acknowledgement of STARS, you all offered. So on our website, if you go to our ETD, pay, our thesis dissertation page, there's a map that shows all the downloads of a thesis or dissertation and Carrie offered that to us. And we're like, yes, we will put that up on our website. So that helps introduce people to where is our, um, where are our, our, our ETDs, you know, where do they reside um, and help kind of promote STARS to the greater UCF community so they know through, e, you know, if they find an ETD, there might be other things they can go find in STARS as well. So just to kind of wrap up that, that side of the partnership a little bit. Um, yeah, but no, uh, <laughs> I would introduce our our, our, la our our one of our other panelists is Sarah Norris. So she is also from the UCF Libraries. Thanks, Natalia. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Natalia said, I'm Sarah Norris. I'm our scholarly communication librarian, and I suppose it's fitting that I'm kind of ending some of the library perspective because I work with all of you in really different ways, um, but all to support um, 
research, copyright publishing, and especially for ETDs. Um, and as you probably saw, I'll give you a quick apologies or fun for the afternoon. You probably saw my cat Cactus, who is an honorary panelist, as Emily mentioned. So you may see him pop in, the joys of working remotely, as I'm sure you all are very aware and familiar with from the last year or so. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about the copyright and publishing support that I work with, um, both in the library and then also graduate studies, uh, the ways in which we engage our students and help not only tackle sort of those ad hoc case by case copyright and publishing questions, but really looking to provide uh, strong educational opportunities. I know Gail mentioned that earlier in the keynote, you know, really making sure we reach our students throughout the process, not when they're turning in uh, their thesis or dissertation and there's a copyright conundrum or challenge, which Wendy will probably nod her head. We have lots of those, uh, but we really wanna get those students earlier on. And so as I've been at UCF for the last six years, those conversations have been ongoing. We've developed new services and different kinds of workshops. And that's really due to the partnership that we have between graduate studies and a library, because we can really bounce off different ideas, feedback that we're getting from our faculty and students, the questions that are coming up. And that's really driven a lot of the different things that have evolved over time. Um, so we do several things, as I mentioned, workshops, individual assistance, those are probably the key areas. Um, and that happens with STARS. So Lee and Carrie will reach out to me when we have those queries. Um, we do like to make sure that through graduate studies, uh, I work closely with Kareen on how we um, incorporate scholarly communication topics in our graduate workshop series. And so we've got kind of that primary workshop series. Through that, I offer a publishing workshop and a copyright basics workshop. So those are two different workshops that are offered. Uh, the first one deals with more broad scale publishing. But one of the things that was brought up also in the keynote that I think is helpful to talk through is this idea of author rights. So helping students, again, really early in that process, understand what permissions are, what they might be signing when they sign an agreement with a, a publisher, understanding use rights post-publication. I think that one's really critical for ETDs, especially for those who might be utilizing published works in them already. And so we get lots of questions about that. So really providing that foundational information earlier is very helpful. And then the copyright basic session that's through our graduate workshop series that librarians offer is more foundational, kind of getting them started, getting them thinking about copyright uh, as they're going through their tenure at UCF. And then I mentioned that we have a lot of those iterative conversations, what's working, what are the you know outstanding needs, what are some areas that we can provide additional education for, and one of those um, developed this last year, uh, we've seen a real rise in questions related to images and copyright for ETDs. And so again, thinking about ways we can provide some good education earlier in the process, um, Natalia and Wendy suggested, hey, we have this academic integrity workshop series. Um, it's a required workshop series for some programs at UCF. And so many of our graduate students are gonna go through that program. What if we offered a workshop on copyright and images? And so we were able to put a proposal together that got approved. We launched it this summer. And I've been really pleased with it because we're getting lots of students attending, asking good questions. And hopefully that's gonna help as those students go through the process, mitigating some of the challenges that many are facing during the submission process for their ETD with copyright images. So I think that's a really good example of how these conversations can grow and evolve into new opportunities. Uh, same thing with faculty. So through our conversations, we developed a faculty specific workshop geared towards graduate faculty who are advising on theses and dissertations. Again, just to kind of reach everybody and help provide that education. And then of course we do a lot of individual assistance. I think Wendy and Natalia and I are emailing all the time about different things that come up from students. So Wendy and Natalia are great at forwarding any queries that come through that they don't feel like they are able to fully address so that we can make sure that we get, take care of those in a timely fashion. And again, help those students at the point of need. Um, many times it's at the end of that 
thesis or dissertation submission process. So there's a real time sensitive nature of those queries. So we do a lot of that. Um, and again, those are all really good ways to drive um, how we navigate copyright support more broadly at the institution. Um, and the last thing I'll mention that's sort of tangentially related um, is our open access publishing fund that we have through the College of Graduate Studies. This is just another example of the way our partnership has evolved with the library and grad studies. So we have a scholarly communication a faculty advisory board. Through that board, uh, we developed some ideas for an open access publishing fund. Graduate studies made that come to life. And so we have this great fund that's available for graduate students and postdocs interested in open access publishing. And so that's available. And then I also help throughout that process when any of our colleagues have questions, especially about vetting criteria or other kinds of things that arise through the approval and proposals for that open access publishing fund. So there's a lot of different ways that you can uh, collaborate, evolve services. Um, and certainly I think all the different examples everyone shared today really shows that we can be providing really substantive support to our students throughout the process, whether it's an ETD or any time during their tenure at UCF. So that's it for me. Thank you, Sarah. Um, well, we'll finish up with our, our last person is Wendy Cartier, um, also from the College of Graduate Studies, but you can tell them your role in all of this, Wendy. <laughs> Thanks, Natalia. Um, so like Natalia said, I am under the College of Graduate Studies. I'm the coordinator for thesis and dissertation. And so my role is to conduct a format review for all of the master's and doctoral students who plan to graduate in any given term. And we typically receive between 200 to 250 submissions on average each term, um, fall, spring, and summer. And those submissions usually result in a little under 200 or right around 200 actually completing in that term with the rest rolling over. But it's, it's a large number of documents to look at. And Natalia provides a lot of support for also looking at the documents for review purposes. But the other support that I rely on so much comes from these wonderful people at the library who you've been hearing, um, especially with the copyright questions. I am constantly sending people to Sarah. <laughs> it's like, okay, here's this situation. I think I know the right thing to tell you, but here's who you want to talk to. And I'm always contacting Carrie with questions or responding to a question from her, from a student who's asking about when their document is available or why is their document available. Sometimes they fill out an embargo and then they don't actually know what they've done. Um, UCF has several different ways in which students can have a limited embargo before their work ultimately becomes publicly available, but they can have limited access within the UCF community for one, three or five years. And they do have the option for a six month patent hold. And we know that um, when we transfer those records to the library, that the students who have that community hold, it's going to be locked down that you need um, ID access to be able to see the document until such time as that expires. And then that's where sometimes students don't realize that the five year embargo does expire and then it's out there so we get some questions sometimes but um you know with all of these ladies we know that we can direct students there for questions and they likewise send people back to us and it, none of us could do our jobs without knowing how much we can count on each other and uh, that's really it for me i see that we may have some questions or oh Yep, uh, Lily has a question for you, Sarah, about sharing your copyright resources. <laughs> yes, um, so we actually don't have, we're actually in the midst of redoing all our copyright and intellectual property research guides right now. So I don't have a great copyright and images page, although I've been putting many of my presentations on copyright into STARS. So I can hear some of the 
stars link so you can always go there and hopefully we will start adding a bit more of those in as well but feel free lily to send me an email and i can send you any of my slide decks that aren't in stars right now because some of them i don't have in as they are uh evolving and changing <laughs> um, well thank you for the question anybody else has any questions I'll, um please go ahead and feel free to to ask um i just wanted to thank everybody for for telling us a little bit about everything i, I think um the important takeaway I would say is reaching out to people, right? It's making those connections. And is there somebody on your campus? And I know we're, we're a large campus, but is there somebody um, that is providing a service that you can talk to about or partner with? It's, it's, it's finding folks who have an expertise and, and, and offering something in kind, like I can help you with this. Can you help me with that? Um, and, and that's something we've done over years and years. And it's really, I think all of us have, I think, a, a big goal to, to serve our students, right? Like that's what we're all here for is to is to serve students. Um, and, and I think we achieve that in different ways, but I think that's a good end goal probably to, to kind of say that we all do is really how can we help them where needs being met, where are they not being met, who can help with something. Um, and they, and everybody's only so gracious with this. And I, and I feel like we all are very lucky with our supervisors as well, right? Like we have to kind of not, it's not just us. We have, we have that support from our individual units as well as like, yes, we want you working with the library and vice versa. The library is always, yes, work with the college graduate studies. And I know that can be a challenge in some places, um, but it's opening up those conversations. Sometimes it might take having a dean or somebody higher level talk to somebody else if, if that conversation is not really flowing as well, or you're not sure who to go to at first, but um, our relationships, like as we said, have, have been built over a long period of time, but it, it just takes reaching out and, and trying, you know, to, to say who can help with something, who can do something, who are your experts on campus, who really knows how to do something, um, you know, that, that you're, you're maybe not as comfortable with. So I would say that's probably my, my parting um, uh, comment on all of this. So Natalia, I would say that really having good, strong, open communication mm -hmm. has been so important because some of the conversations are not easy conversations, right? right? I mean, we yes. heard that in the keynote. We mm -hmm. you know that all the time. Some of these are not easy conversations. Some of right. them are very detailed conversations. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the things that we have done, we, um, you know, have really been very thoughtful about how we approach things. And we said, yes. you know, we're going to change this process, but we're going to change it over the next year. And we're right. going to have monthly meetings, we're going to have quarterly meetings, we're going to get everybody in the room. And we would just sit down and we would talk for an hour. And then we would go away and process it, you know, <laughs> and then we would come back. So yeah. um, really, that has been the best thing is that everybody has been willing to be open with the dialogue. Yes. And then reaching out when there is a problem, not mm -hmm. letting it, you know, I, I, if I, there's something that might be not so great, I would rather just say, Hey, Lee, heads up, this thing might be coming along or something might happen. Um, Sarah, you know, there's an issue over here, you know, whatever it might be, or Corrine, you know, we've, we've got this, you know, thing that might come up. So it's like she said, that open communication and, and, and respecting your partners and that they have a role in what you're doing. So it's a huge part. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody has any other questions, but uh, you can always yeah, are there? email any of us as well. I mean, we're <laughs> listed on the contacts. Well, thank you so much for this really wonderful presentation. You've given us a lot of things to think about and a, a lot of things to strategize um, at our own institution. So thank you so much for your expertise. Um, and, and like Natalia said, if you all have any questions for them after this session is over, feel free to reach out um, via email. Um, so I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day and um, hopefully we'll see you again tomorrow too. So. Thanks, Thank Emily. you. Thank you.